So our last speaker of this uh, opening session is an assistant professor from the University of Cincinnati, earned his MD at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, and then went to Texas for uh, residency in pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital, and then back to uh, Philadelphia for a dual fellowship in neonatology and medical genetics. Uh, so he's one of uh, happily a growing cadre of young people who are double boarded in both of these specialties. Uh, he's the recipient of a career development award from the NIH, which he has been taking wonderful advantage of, having published both in uh, the genetics literature and in the neonatology literature, and uh, now is uh, turning his attention to the intersection of those two things, and his recent publications combine those two areas of expertise. So he'll be talking to us this morning uh, about the molecular and cellular underpinnings of lung development, and I'm sure that those will have significant significance for the kinds of diseases that we all encounter. Dr. Daniel Soir, welcome to Stanford and to the podium. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to fill in for Dr. Witsit this morning. He had uh, prior family obligations, but it's a, it's a great honor to be here, and it's, a, it's great to be able to fill in. It's big shoes to fill, so I'll do my best. Um, today, uh, in, in building on what we've heard this morning, uh, I really wanted to fill in and address you know, some of the great questions that came up in the, in the session this morning of how we're using tools at Cincinnati Children's from developmental biology to understand and try to better understand a lot of the questions that were just raised, I think in particular in the past session, um, and using some new tools from um, both genetics as well as developmental and systems biology to improve our understanding of perinatal, neonatal, and pediatric lung disorders. And so today is really going to be, a, I'd say, a tasting from a number of different projects. So we'll hopefully give you an overview of what's going on and what we think are future directions in the field um, rather than a deep dive in any one particular topic. So I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards if you have any more detailed questions about those particular talks. So the, the first half, I'm really going to present a lot of work done from um, the WITSIT group in, in, in particular in the Lung Map um, NIH consortium um, in a more broader respect um, from single cell data trying to address some of these fundamental questions about these surfactinopathies that we spent the morning talking about. How do they lead to the epithelial injury and the fibrotic responses that we're seeing um, in using single cell technology to try to understand the cell-cell interactions that are occurring in these diseases? Then build, building on that information using mouse knockout MOS models from some of the diseases that we've heard about, like ABCA deficiency. Um, and then I want to finish up the talk by briefly talking about work that we've done in congenital pulmonary airway malformations, as well as finishing up with some newer technologies of where we see kind of both our research as well as the broader field in going and understanding these types of processes. Um, so the first part, I'm going to talk about a paper that you may have recently seen from uh, the WITSA group in Nature Communications, um, looking at and trying to answer some of these fundamental questions about how disorders of surfactant processing um, result in the disruptions that we've been talking about. And so just to give you a brief background, um, this is a fantastic place to be giving this talk because a lot of the technology that I'll talk about was developed right here on the Stanford campus. Um, and in particular, one of the first major four ways into single cell sequencing in the lung was actually done here um, in Mark Krasnow um, and Stephen Quake's group where they looked at the epithelium in particular and had a second paper looking at the mesenchyme, looking at um, gene expression across the entire transcriptome in individual cells, which is a really powerful tool and let them identify different populations, both the type 1 and type 2 cells that we knew about that were in the distal lung, um, but also develop a, a lineage hierarchy based on the transcriptome model um, and suggesting the presence of a bipotent progenitor cell um, the, from which the type 1 and two, type 2 cells are deriving. This was based on the fluidime platform. There's a newer technology that has both pros and cons compared to fluidime. Um, but the remarkable thing is it lets you look at the individual transcriptome of many thousands of cells at a single time from essentially a single sample. And what it does is it you basically feed in through a microfluidic fluidic platform cells along with droplets that barcode those. And then each cell has its own barcode. And all the mRNAs in that cell are barcoded with that particular unique cell identifier. So you can essentially get what 
you may have experience with with either microarray data or, or RNA seq that you've probably done on either whole, long, or bulk sorted cell samples from a say flow cytometry on single cells, which is really powerful, and that's you look at not only all the cells that are in that sample and rare cell populations, but start to make predictions from a bioinformatics standpoint of what types of cell-cell interactions and signaling pathways that might be occurring between those different cell types. And that's been one of the major focus of the Witsit Lab um, through kind of large-scale NIH efforts like the lung map over the past several years. Um, and this, as we've heard a lot about and been highlighted really nicely with a lot of the diseases that we're all interested in, is looking at one of the most complex addicts adaptations that happens during our life, which is the transition from the in utero environment to the postnatal postnatal life, which is, as we've always thought of, as a huge stress on the infant um, and gets disrupted in, in the context of prematurity. Um, but what the single cell data highlights is even on the molecular level, that's an incredibly stressful process, which I'll hopefully show you today. So this is just, again, a high-level overview of the data. Um, and I should mention all of this, I'll put the website up then, but this is all publicly available, and um, the WITSA group and Jan Zhu's lab, who is the bioinformatics arm of that effort, has done a really nice job of making this all readily available online to anyone who's um, interested in accessing this data for your own research. Um, so I'll point that out at the end. But you can see um, these plots basically um, plot out um, it's sort of a, essentially a principal component analysis based on gene expression patterns of the different cell types. And you see mesenchymal cells, endothelial cells, epithelial cells all separating nicely. Um, epithelial, within the epithelial population, you can clearly see the airway cells separating from the distal uh, alveolar epithelial cells. And then this population of, of that confused type 1 and type 2 cells that um, Krauss now identified as the bipotent uh, cell population. Um, and again, here you can see um, the type 1 markers like ager and potoplanin clustering um, with the AT1 cells, surfactant proteins clustering with the AT2 cells, and then this intermediate population in between. Um, and they've developed a number of tools um, through Yanzu's group and the Witsit lab to map out these pathways. Um, and one thing I want to focus on in particular, um, I should say jump before we jump to that particular pathway, is looking at patterns of gene expression. Um, there's a lot of genes that go different directions as, as the uh, mice are born, but they were particularly interested in at genes that peak right around the time of postnatal development. And when you look at those genes, um, there are things that you'd expect. Um, so there's a lot of cell proliferation occurring, um, and there's um, a lots of lipid and protein synthesis in the context of surfactant production, which we've known needed to happen for a long period of time around the time of birth. But what was pretty remarkable, at least from my standpoint when I first saw this data, was that there's a dramatic unfolded protein response that they see right around the time of birth. Um, uh, the Witsit lab did um, a lot of characterization since that was just based on single cell data, looking at this with more traditional techniques like Western blotting and immunohistochemistry to validate that this, in fact, was occurring predominantly in the, the airway cells as well as the type 2 cells right around the time of birth, where you have a large number of genes involved in the un unfolded protein response that are being activated right around the time of birth, um, peaking um, on that first postnatal day uh, of life and then decreasing thereafter. Um, showing that, as we kind of always knew from clinically, there's a, but the response at the time of birth is incredibly stressful, and there's a huge unfolded protein response that has to happen to deal with just that massive increase in protein and surfactant production that occurs at the time of birth. And filling in, that, and that uh, I've always thought is a pathologic response, but is probably adaptive and relatively mild in the context of normal birth, but certainly can get disrupted um, in the setting of prematurity or illness. And so to, again, to uh, better address some of the biology, the Witsit lab has um, looked at conditional knockouts of, of several genes involved in protect. Uh, pro surfactant synthesis, including EMC3, which is um, an ER-associated protein. And when this gene is deleted, they saw essentially normal lung development, but collapse of the airways in um, pathophysiology similar to what we see with respiratory distress after birth. 
Similarly, as Larry Nogi is talking about, um, the Witsit lab has been interested in modeling ABCA3, which we know is a clinically important disease. Um, and again, what's remarkable is in these mice, they actually do quite well with conditional deletion for several days. Um, and then really rapidly around the two weeks of life, there's a, a marked drop off. All the S pups essentially die right around two weeks of birth. When they, these mice is a conditional deletion um, that's introduced with tamoxifen into their diet. And so if, when these mice, if you withdraw the tamoxifen right around the time that these mice are starting to die, there's a really dramatic recovery, meaning that the few surviving type two cells, if you take away that conditional deletion are able to recover and really completely repair the lung, which is remarkable. And um, again, that same unfolded protein response that we see as a normal and probably adaptive response in the pups immediately after birth is, is dramatically upregulated in probably a pathologic fashion in the mice that are, aren't able to uh, process surfactant properly through ABCA3 or EMC3 mutations. And they've looked at this at the single cell level and again see a lot of the same pathways involved in a pathologic manner in these surfactinopathy mice um, that are very similar to what is seen as a, essentially a normal response in the first postnatal day of life um, dealing with that transition to breathing. Um, and again, as we've talked about, one of the things that the Witsit Lab is interested in is trying to use new technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to potentially correct some of these mutations. And that's a sort of pie-in-the-sky approach, um, but something that may be technically achievable for the field over the next decade or so. Um, so just to summarize, the, through their work with single cell sequencing, the postnatal lung, um, the Witsit Lab was able to identify over 20 five distinct pulmonary cell types in mouse uh, lung on postnatal day one. Um, there's two progenitor-like epithelial cell types um, in that uh, essentially bipotent progenitor cell that the Krasnow's groups identified, as well as a similar population in the airway epithelium. And what was really remarkable is the unfold unfolded protein response that they saw at birth. And their conclusions were that heightened baseline stress renders AT2 cells susceptible to added stress by causing, um, caused by misfolded or inactive surfactant proteins, um, which are important in, in diseases like ABCA3 deficiency. Um, I'll show this again, but as I mentioned, um, here's the website where all of the, the data that's been generated through LungMap is available. Probably the easiest way to get to it is if you search LGEA um, on Google, you'll find that. Um, so what I wanted to do is spend the second half of the talk talking about some work that we've done on congenital pulmonary airway malformations. I'm going to highlight how looking at transcriptomic data can provide some insights into the pathogenesis of a poorly understood structural birth defect. And again, finish up with some work that we're doing in my lab and in looking at epigenomics to try to understand some of these transcriptional changes that we're seeing both in the context of normal development and disease. Um, so probably mo most of the audience, since there's pediatric pulmonary and neonatologists, most of the audiences are probably familiar with this otherwise relatively rare disorder. Um, so as you know, it's a cystic maldevelopment of lung tissue that's predominantly seen, at least in our clinical experience in otherwise normal infants, usually occurs as a single lesion in an otherwise normally developed lung. Um, the classic teaching, at least when I kind of started looking into this in fellowship and textbooks, was that type 1 or macrocystic lesions are the most common cell type, or excuse me, subtype of CPAM lesions, which I think in, in retrospect has a lot to do with ascertainment bias. Um, and in the literature, at least the historic literature, there's a relatively high incidence of associated malformations, which we weren't seeing in clinical practice. And, and again, a lot of lesions reported, at least in the historic literature, were ascertained based on being symptomatic. Um, so what we did um, as a, I started this as a fellow at CHOP, um, we were actually able to prospectively enroll just under 60 infants where we were able to collect a comprehensive clinical data set. And what's really unique, as probably many of the people in this audience are aware about this disease, is that we actually have a pretty good treatment for it. We can just resect the entire lobe of the lung um, that the pediatric surgeons at um, experience centers like this and others across the country are really good at with have a relatively low morbidity and mortality. 
Um, but from a research standpoint, what's really nice is that it gives you the opportunity to detain both relatively healthy neonatal lung tissue along with the disease tissue. So you essentially have an internal control for each sample that you enroll. So we were able to do that um, for this disorder, and we were able to get RNA. Um, for our initial study, all of the RNA that we obtained was from whole lung tissue, is not cell sorted. We also have DNA sample, uh, samples stored for all these patients at CHOP. Um, and then, of course, tissue for histology. And then in the context of that project, in part because of the discrepancies we are seeing in our clinical experience with what was reported in the literature, we did a larger case review uh, over a period of about two and a half years um, at CHOP, which ended up being 184 lesions from 174 patients. So there were actually some patients we saw that had more than one lesion um, in their lung. And what we found, and, and probably is similar to what a lot of other people talking in at globally have seen in clitor clinical experiences, that Type 1 lesions or the macrocystic lesions were not the most common. Most of the lesions we saw were microcystic lesions, um, type 2, depending on which classification scheme you use, or um, some variant of sequestration, bronchial um, uh, intralobar, extralobar sequestrations, or as CHOP um, likes to call them, hybrid lesions, which are sequestrations with ha which have histologic elements of a CPAM. Um, the type 1 or macrocystic lesions were relatively uncommon, but at least in our cohort, which was a pretty good number of patients for a relatively uncommon disorder, is that most of these infants were actually symptomatic. Um, the mean age, med excuse me, median age of resection was one day of life, and about two-thirds of them required intubation, mechanical ventilation, and resection in that first week of life. In contrast to our microcystic lesion patients, most of whom were asymptomatic and came back at two to three months of life for a resection. Um, we did do, and I'll just kind of briefly touch on this, we did histology um, and looked at a number of major cell type markers, uh, kind of consistent with what we had known from the classic histopathology literature is that lesions really look like well-differentiated airway structures um, when you look at the cyst. Um, they express SOX2, um, and they're marked with um, typical airway epithelial markers like keratin, um, uh, excuse me, uh, keratin-8. Um, and I actually took that out, but uh, your typical ciliated and secretory markers are also expressed as well. Um, we used um, actually, you know, in kind, of, in kind of comparison to the single cell data, relatively simple techniques, because this is kind of new and hadn't been looked at, um, just basically gene expression on whole long. But even with that, we're able to identify important transcriptional differences. Um, the microcystic and hybrid lesions clustered together. Um, we only had a couple of macrocystic lesions, so we're really limited in being able to comment on whether they look different, but they certainly, based on the two lesions we had, did seem to look different transcriptionally, so we focused on the microcystic and hybrid lesions. Whether that's just numbers or whether that's a true difference, kind of we'll uh, we need more numbers to figure that out. Um, but we identified a number of potential pathways that we're exploring using kind of orthogonal techniques currently, including PI3 kinase and mTOR signaling. Um, as well as uh, KRAS um, that we're following up on. Um, one interesting thing that we did was we actually took the epithelium from these lesions that we um, sorted with flow cytometry um, and then used it in an organoid system where we um, co-cultured them with a fibroblast cell line MRC5. So both the uh, normal uh, isolated lung epithelium as well as the diseased lung epithelium were cultured with the same population of fibroblasts. Um, and in contrast to the normal epithelium, which formed relatively thin walled tracheospheres, the CPAM epithelium formed these kind of very thick walled um, structures that were fewer in number but significantly larger. Um, and seem to be predominantly composed of P6 3 3 positive basal cells, suggesting there's an intrinsic dip difference in the epithelium that's retained even in, these are all postnatally collected samples. Um, so despite the fact that the CPAM lesions really seem to plateau in their growth kind of in that late um, perinatal period and, and don't seem to expand in the postnatal period, um, whatever pathology uh, intrinsic to the epithelium does seem to persist. So there seems to be an epithelial intrinsic defect um, that persists in the postnatal period. So our, our hypotheses, which we haven't tested yet, would be that our kind of best explanation would be that there's potentially a somatic mosaic genetic change that's occurring within the epithelium of these lesions that results in the CPAM pathogenesis. The way to test that would probably be to do 
whole exome sequencing on both the paired and, and diseased tissue samples that we have um, to test that hypothesis, but we haven't done that yet. And we're looking at some of these pathways that we, we've identified through our transcriptional analysis um, in, in mouse models. And so just to finish up with some current uh, directions, I think one of the major future directions for the field, certainly that we're interested in in my lab and I think broader um, through the Witsit lab and, and the lung map is understanding how our epigenome regulates these gene expression changes that we're seeing and how cell identity is established during our normal development and then retained and how those patterns of cell identity are lost in disease processes. So there's obviously a lot of layers to this and it's complex and involves chromatin accessibility and chromatin packaging as well as histone post-translational modifications. Um, you know, and why is this important? I think there's growing evidence that e even though we've um, done a great job of understanding many of the major transcription factors and signaling pathways that go into establishing some of these major cell types, we don't understand how the, all that information is integrated and retained on the cellular, cellular level and how those processes get disrupted in disease processes. And I think there's a relatively new but growing body of evidence that in a number of diseases, and I think a lot of the studies have been done mostly on adult diseases, things like IPF where we clearly know there's loss of cell type identity, there's widespread changes in things like DNA methylation, and at least interest suggestions based on single cell de seq data from um, Witz's group that there's dysregulation of uh, probably histone marks like polycomb targets. Um, and so we're using um, an approach, again, developed right here at Stanford um, called the TAC-seq to understand chromatin accessibility. Um, and I think there's a lot of new tools being developed so we can apply things like ChIP-seq to individual cell populations. I'll just finish up quickly. I know we're running short on time, but um, we've used these techniques to look at um, epithelial, distal epithelial development in the lung by fact sorting SOX9 progenitor cells and applying um, RNA-seq and attack-seq on this specific cell population. Um, gives you nice data where in an individual lung cell population, you can see areas of chromatin accessibility. I'm just showing you the NKX 2.1 locus. And despite the fact that we don't have ChIP-seq on these specific cell populations, at least yet, you can overlay them with nicely available um, data sets through ENCODE that are developed on whole lung and, and see pretty remarkable overlap between the chromatin accessibility that we have from early developmental time points with um, whole lung data um, obtained through ENCODE. And you can look at changes in the regions of chromatin accessibility um, and really combining through kind of some high level analysis, start to look at potentially changes in not only chromatin accessibility, but regions of, of, of chromatin accessibility that don't seem to be changing, changes in histone marks using publicly available data, um, which I think will give us a lot of information about how cell type identity is being established and. Um, and retained or lost in various disease processes. I'll skip over that and just kind of finish up again um, using uh, computational methods that are developed here, trying to integrate these pathways um, and um, using some new technologies where I think within probably a year, within a couple of years, we'll be able to do these same types of analyses on individual cells. So just like the single cell data I showed you at the beginning of the talk, we'll be able to have single cell attack seek data and using some newer variants of ChIP-seq, I think at the very least, um, very soon we'll be able to do ChIP-seq methods derived on uh, relatively small numbers of sorted cells from the lung and probably within a couple of years be able to do ChIP-seq for multiple marks on single cells. So I think within a very short period of time as a field, we'll be able to understand not only transcriptional changes, but chromatin accessibility and multiple histone post-translational modifications in individual lung cells in the context of normal development in human disease. Um, so that's what we're working on and what we're interested in. I know it's a lot of different pieces all in one, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. That was really lovely. Um, I have a it's a big clinical dilemma whether these CPAMs should be resected, especially in clinically asymptomatic patients. Did you find any signatures that would support that they have neoplastic potential? 
So yeah, that's a fantastic question. I know the surgeons that I'll talk to have a very strong opinion, because as they always do, they feel very strongly, at least in the, uh, the places that I've trained, that because of the risk of recurrent pneumonias, they should be resected at least for that reason. But the but you know the more potentially compelling reason is the potential risk of malignancy. There's some relatively isolated reports, as I'm sure you're aware of, of these kind of degenerating into adenocarcinoma. What we and others have found um, is that, it, mostly in the context of the macrocystic lesions, there are areas of goblet cell metaplasia that are pretty impressive. Um, and within those lesions, if you microdissect out, we and others have done that, where you microdissect out that tissue, and, and there are um, KRAS, um, the G12D mutation that's typically found in adenocarcinoma in adults. You can find it in those lesions. Um, I, we've only found it in the kind of subset of macrocystic lesions that have that goblet cell metaplasia. Um, and so it doesn't seem to be found in most of the, the CPAM lesions that, that we've identified. And it, it, you know, when you look at that mutation in, in the context of the whole lung tissue, it's an incredibly tiny fraction of the, um, you know, the cells that have that mutation. And so my thought is it's probably a secondary change as a result of, you know, rapid proliferation or whatever disordered signaling that's already occurring in those lesions. And there's some, you know, suggestion from our um, transcriptomic data that there is altered KRAS signaling. And so it may be a compensatory mutation due to, you know, altered RAS signaling in those lesions. Um, I don't think it's a primary change, but whether or not it actually increases your risk of malignancy for those kids, I think, is, is a great open question. Dr. Moss? Can you speculate at all on any of the potential drivers of epigenetic modifications, for example, maternal smoking or other factors that might be at play? So, that's a, you know I think one of the exciting areas about epigenetics um, you know one of the you know as, as Dr. Noji's talk highlighted is as we're starting to understand more about the genetics there's obviously a lot of um, environmental exposures that we don't understand both in the context of monogenetic disease as well as is certainly most of the lung diseases that we see that are not genetic. And so I think um, we certainly have not looked at, but I think one of the big areas for the field will be understanding, as we start to understand what's normal and what actually happens during normal development, how repetitive injury, smoking, and other environmental exposures modifies those normal patterns of, of kind of epigenetic marks and contributes to dysregulated gene expression in the context of the diseases, most of the lung diseases that we see that don't have a major monogenetic component like BPD or asthma or other things like that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Xanthi Korokli from Baylor, Texas Children's. Very good to see you there. <laughs> um, so the newborn uh, mouse has structurally lung that is similar to preterm human babies, but uh, enzymatically, functionally, is more like a term baby. Do you have a comparison, and I know I'm asking for a lot, but that's usually what I get from reviewers too. <laughs> Do you have a comparison between the single cell uh, uh, gene analysis um, uh, in mouse newborn and to human? Yeah, that's a great question. So I know the WITSA group has done standing for a number of the unfolded protein response um, markers in disease contexts like ABCA3 deficiency. I believe they did some staining in, in normal newborn lungs, but obviously um, that you know it's tricky to get, uh, obviously yeah. Yeah. outside the context of maybe a disease like I mentioned, like sure. CPAM getting truly normal newborn lungs. So I don't know um, how much uh, data they have from kind of normal newborn lung samples. But it's a, it's a great question because obviously there's yeah. some pretty significant differences between right. um, postnatal day one in mouse and, and actually term neonates. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.